and welcome to the 27th inning. I am your host, Michael Grinnell, and today we will be hearing from longtime college baseball coach and former Miami Marlins scout, James Valade. Over his 11-year career as a head coach in college baseball, Valade has compiled a career record of 348 wins and 117 losses. His 748 winning percentage ranks him as one of the top coaches in the history of college baseball, and he is the second winningest coach in Texas collegiate baseball history. Along with those accolades, Valade also helped build up from scratch the baseball programs at University of Dallas and University of Texas at Tyler. In his professional baseball career, he served as an assistant coach with the AA Frisco Rough Riders, and most recently, he was an amateur scout for the Miami Marlins where he was instrumental in the scouting of Daxton Fulton, the Marlins' second-round pick in the 2020 draft. Now, he serves as the head coach of the varsity baseball team at Prestonwood Christian Academy's Plano campus, while also continuing his work with the Keeper of the Game Foundation, which he founded in 2014. We'll be back in just a moment, and when we return, you'll hear from former collegiate coach and MLB scout, James Valade. Before we get to today's interview with James, I wanted to take a moment and promote his organization, the Keeper of the Game Foundation. Created in 2014, the mission of this organization is to provide kids and young adults with special needs and disabilities unique baseball experiences that foster the growth of those individuals and their love of baseball. Keeper of the Game promotes programs that allow these athletes to play, watch, and experience baseball at a very personal level. And this is all done with a focus on advancing servant leadership. They do a lot of wonderful work to help kids and young adults with special needs throughout Texas get the opportunity to enjoy the game of baseball in ways that they might not be able to otherwise experience. James will talk about the foundation and its work later in the interview, but make sure to check out their website at keeperofthegame.org and consider making a donation to their organization and help them in their mission to give these kids the chance to enjoy the game that we all love. And now, Here's James Valade. All right, we are here with longtime college baseball coach and Major League Baseball scout James Valade. James, thank you for coming on and speaking with us today. Thanks, Michael. I appreciate you having me on. So let's start off by just talking a little bit about how you got into baseball and coaching and scouting. Uh, I know you played at Baylor. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, your playing career at Baylor and then how you get, got into coaching. You know, I got into coaching. I had an opportunity to uh, to become the head baseball coach at the University of Dallas when I graduated from Baylor. Uh, they were starting the program back after an 18 year absence, and they uh, they were looking for a young guy to come in that was motivated that could help start the program from zero. And that's really where it all started at the University of Dallas. So very fortunate for that opportunity. That was something I was going to ask you about. You've done this not only once but you've done this twice you basically come in and help build a program from the ground up talk a little bit about what goes into that process for you where you're basically starting completely from scratch with a new baseball team and creating a new program yeah I mean the, the biggest thing is you know out of the gate providing the support system for for the players that you're gonna you're gonna recruit and sign you know, that's the most important thing and for me you know being a part of building uh, two fields, University of Dallas didn't have a field, the University of Texas at Tyler didn't have a field. Um, you know, that was very time consuming. Uh, it, was, it was a very challenging process. It was a fun process because you're building from zero. So a lot of the ideas that you have as a coach and a lot of the ideas that you get from other people uh, kind of come to fruition. Of course, you're always working on a budget. So uh, that's a big part of it. But you know, for me, it was it was it was an exciting opportunity to do that, and uh, you know, both both teams had you know had great success in the time I was there. We're very fortunate to have outstanding staffs to work with and and many great players. Yeah, to say that you had some success there is kind of understating it. Uh, from what I understand, you're the second winningest uh, NCAA coach uh, in Texas history in terms of baseball. Talk a little bit about. Uh, this success that you've had and how you've been able to do this with multiple colleges now yeah I think you know for for me you know if somebody would have told me at the start of my career that I'd have the second best winning percentage in the history of NCAA baseball in Texas I would probably tell them they're crazy uh, we just like like to like to win some games and build from there but 
you know, I think the one thing we did was we built um, a very good culture. We surrounded the kids with outstanding coaches and leaders. Uh, and we also had a good balance in the program where it wasn't just about baseball. We really cared about who the players became along the way. Um, you know, the life lessons that, that come across on the field and off the field. Uh, we're you know, really involved in the community, uh, allowing our guys to pour into uh, you know, the community needs wherever we were in, uh, in Dallas, Texas, and Tyler, Texas. So, you know, we try to provide a balance for the players, not just, not just you know, the baseball experience, but the life experience as well. And I think that allowed our, our teams to, to always have really good chemistry. And, you know, the rest kind of history writes itself. I mean, it was, it was an amazing experience. It felt like I coached one team for 11 years and it was two different schools. So um, something I was very thankful to have the opportunity to do. 2007, University of Texas at Tyler. You guys went 37-1 and won that year. Uh, that team's featured in the Texas Sports Hall of Fame. Talk a little bit about that big season for you guys. That must have been something special to be a part of. Yeah, that was that was an amazing run. Uh, we actually went into the last series of the year, and you know we were thirty we were thirty six and zero, uh, lost a game, and then finished thirty seven and one. So experience wise, you know it was one of those things that the machine just kept going. Um, the kids believed in themselves. They they played clean baseball. They played hard baseball. And it was something that nobody really talked about. It was it was pretty, it was pretty uh, obvious what we were doing, and I think a lot of people used to show up to see if we lose, um, just because we were on such a good run. So we may have drew some some extra fans just to see if we would uh, would crack under pressure. But I think one of the cool things that kind of gets you know overlooked a little bit about that streak was we actually had, I think it was about forty five wins in a row at home, and that that encompassed. Uh, three different teams and that was pretty special for all three teams to be a part of that which is a pretty which is pretty unique so um, you know it was it was an awesome run the unfortunate part about being 37 and one was we were not eligible to go to the postseason because we were new to the NCAA and we were provisional members of the NCAA so we could win our conference and then we had to had to call it a day but um, I think that's one of the best teams in, in the in the history of college baseball not just the league we were playing in or the division we were playing in, but not many people can go out and say, you know, we won 37 out of, out of 38 games. Um, pretty, pretty unbelievable in the game of baseball. So obviously you've had a very successful time uh, coaching in college baseball. You've also spent some time working with major league baseball. Uh, you've served as a coach with the double a Frisco rough riders and you also have served as a scout with the Rangers and the Marlins. Uh, start off by talking a little bit about uh, coaching with uh, AA, what you did there, and some of the guys that you saw during your time there. I think coaching, uh, you know, coaching in AA was something that I really never saw myself doing. Uh, I was fortunate to get the opportunity from uh, Mike Bollinger, who was originally with the Red Sox and moved over to the Rangers and, and Mike had, had seen me coach and he'd seen me work with players and he felt that I would be a good addition to what he was trying to build as a hitting coordinator uh, for the Rangers. So that experience was, was unbelievable. I mean, I got to work with a lot of, uh, a lot of great players, get to work with Hall of Famers, um, but also helped develop some of the best talent that the Rangers have had over the last 15 years, uh, working with guys like Joey Gallo, Elvis Andrews, and, and a host of others. So the one thing that my experience with the Rangers did was it, it made, it made me better. And, you know, I poured everything I, everything I had every day into the players, uh, Mike Daly, who's the assistant GM of the Rangers. He and I talked and we talked about my coaching philosophy. And I was told Mike, I coach every player, like they're going to the big leagues. Like there's no, you know, there was no difference in how I treated guys or how I helped develop guys or what we were, you know, what our daily commitment was. But I think for our whole staff, I was very fortunate. I worked for, four different managers um, in, in six years, actually five different managers in six years. So I only worked for one guy twice, which was Steve Bouchel, uh, legendary third baseman uh, for the Rangers. But through those times, I was very fortunate to have amazing guys around me and guys that were, were really keyed into the game and developing players. And the guys that, that I got to locker next to and learn from, I mean, I got to locker next to Pudge Rodriguez, Greg Maddox, Michael Young, 
Um, guys like Casey Candell, Tony Fernandez, those are all guys that poured into my career, and I'm still sharing a lot of the information today that they poured into me. So that was that was an awesome experience. You just listed off some big names there that you worked with, a couple of Hall of Famers there. Talk a little bit more about what it was like working with them. You know, it was it was amazing. I, you know, with 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 Greg Maddox, the time that I was around him, you know, obviously he was on the pitching side and I was on the hitting and uh, and infield side. So I would, I would go out and watch him work with guys. And, and the one thing that um, the gift that he had is he's got such a good mind, but he's, a, he's amazingly simplistic in how he teaches the game and shares the game. So I think it might have been a little bit opposite of what I might expect uh, from Greg Maddox, but he really has a unique way of conveying, you know, a big message in a simple way. Um, you know, being able to go out on the field with Tony Fernandez, uh, you know, work with infielders, I, I think the big thing for me is, you know, I never really imagined or dreamed that I'd be on the field with Tony Fernandez, you know, I mean, he is, he's one of the best shortstops to ever play the game and just watching him go, watching him teach and, and me being a guy that played first base, third base and caught, I didn't play middle infield, you know, growing up or in college. So be able to soak up that information from a legend was, was unbelievable. It was second to none. Great experience. Now we've talked a lot about your coaching experience, but another thing I really want to dive into because I've always been curious to learn more about this is the scouting side uh, of your career. Uh, just start off by talking a little bit about what exactly did you do as a scout for the Rangers and the Marlins? Like what was kind of your day-to-day -day, uh, activities? You know, the day-to-day -day activities of the Marlins for me included covering North Texas, the entire state of Oklahoma, the entire state of Arkansas, and North Louisiana. So I had a very, very good, uh, prosperous baseball area to, uh, to cover. Um, and day-to-day -day is basically, you know, finding, finding guys that match what our needs are in the draft, finding guys that we think can be major league players, impact major league players, and basically sorting through that list and trying to make the best decision for the organization that we can. Uh, going literally going everywhere. I mean, great players come from a lot of different places, but uh, my area is definitely um, it's definitely a hotbed. North Texas is great baseball. The state of Arkansas has the number one team in the country in college. Um, you know, we've got some really good programs in Oklahoma, and so it was. It, it's challenging. You know, it's a challenging area to cover. But um, you know, I think the one thing the Marlins are great at is they they streamline everything. Um, you know, through the organization, communication is great. I think leader at the top of Derek Jeter, um, Gary Denbo, another great leader, DJ Spillick, our scouting director, and Ryan Wardinsky, who uh, who I work with on a daily basis. You know, couldn't ask for a better group. Now you just mentioned DJ Spillick, the scouting director for the Marlins. I was researching and I found an article where it talked about last year's draft picks. And DJ, he mentioned you specifically when talking about second round pick Daxton Fulton, saying that you did a great job of getting to know the family and kind of helping with uh, that decision process. So talk a little bit about uh, using Daxton Fulton as an example. Talk about what you did in terms of scouting him and developing that connection that led to the Marlins selecting him. Yeah, the one the one thing that I was fortunate uh, to have is is a, a, a pre existing relationship with Dax, knowing him, scouting him, recruiting him uh, at the collegiate level when I was uh, when I was coaching in college, and so getting to watch him grow and develop, and then understanding where he was by his senior year, as far as okay, this is where he is right now, but continue with the projection knowing what kind of kid he was, the talent that he had, the way that he handled himself, the maturity. Um, he, had, he had professional traits already, you know, burned into his baseball DNA. So I think the one thing we always talk about is, is, is the person professional? You know, can they be professional? Will they be professional? And for younger players, I always look for some of those qualities um, out of the gate. And I think Dax made it pretty easy on us to, to make the decision that, yeah, this, this guy is going to be a, a true professional. As far as the performance evaluation goes, you know, we're all holding the same kind of radar gun. We're all in the same games. And, you know, sometimes you see different things that, that maybe other scouts don't, but he, he made it really easy from a makeup, a, a competitiveness standpoint. Uh, he made it really easy to, to want to bring him into the Marlins. Now, it seems like you'd, you brought up obviously the talent and the performance on the game, 
And that's what a lot of fans will look at when they're thinking about these prospects and whatnot. But you also mentioned that you also really look into kind of the mental aspect and the makeup of a player. Talk a little bit about what is that you're looking for in terms of like the mental makeup and how you're able to scout that part of a player's profile. Yeah, I think the one thing that's really important to, to me is can the player play every pitch? You know, can you can you be present for every pitch that's that's being thrown, whether you're throwing it or you're defending it? I think that's a big that's a big part of advancement in the game. It's a tough part of the game to uh, to learn to let stuff roll off your back, you know, pretty quickly. Uh, but also handle the success of you know, hey, you hit a home run, great. You know, we gotta we gotta keep playing. Um, hey, you made an error. Most most important part of an error is the next play. Uh, so. I think for, you know, for a guy like, for a guy like Dax, you know, going back to him, you know, the one thing that you really want to try to see uh, when you scout a player is how the person handles success and how the person handles failure, because there's going to be a time in his career where he's going to go out there and he's going to have a no hitter through seven. And it, it's, it's going to happen. And there might be a time where he doesn't have his best stop and he might be out of the game with two outs in the second. So as far as how you handle it and how you bounce back, that's one thing that I'm, I'm big on. Um, I don't mind seeing failure. Of course, we have to see success a large, you know, majority of the time there's, there's track record, there's performance, there's things that, that come into play with being able to advance, but we also have to see how they handle the failure because it, it, it is a tough game and um, it's part of it. And as far as moving on and developing, you gotta be able to kind of take the good with the bad and figure out a way to make yourself better. Now we just went over the mental aspect Talk a little bit about the physical, the performance in game. Like, what are some of the things that you're specifically looking for from a player? Is it just, you know, stats like the number of strikeouts, how fast they're throwing or whatever? Or are there other physical aspects of the game that fans might not think of to look at? You know, I think, I think the first thing that comes to mind is, is the overall athleticism and the ability for the athlete to sustain a, a long season. Um, it, it, really, it really is uh, a test on your body. So athleticism, your ability to, uh, to bounce back and play every day uh, is, is huge. And, you know, as far as the skill set goes, yes, you know, the, the strikeout numbers um, for hitters are, are at an all-time high. You know, it just seems like guys are striking out more. The one thing we do know is strikeouts don't get better as you climb. They usually get worse because you're, you're facing the, the next set of elite pitchers as you go. So I think, you know, the one thing for, for me as far as position players, is guys have to be able to uh, show us what kind of offensive player they are. And I think with an offensive player, it's, it's consistency. It's just being able to move the ball forward. It's being a tough out. And then, you know, strikes and stuff. You know, when you're a pitcher, you, you, you know, you can't defend a walk. You never could. So being able to keep everything around the plate, command the baseball, and then the stuff that goes with, you know, the, the, the deception package of a pitcher, um, being able to have multiple ways to get guys out is always, you know, it's always a bell that rings pretty loud in my head. Now, obviously, not everybody that plays in the minors is going to make it to the major leagues. We've only had just over 20,000 players ever to reach Major League Baseball now. But what's something that a fan in the stands or a fan watching at home could try and watch a game and see as a sign that, you know, maybe this guy will make it to the majors? Yeah, I think I think the, the one thing is this is um, is is being able to play with a sense of urgency. I think successful players are guys that um, you know they have a beat on just about every aspect of the game, and they don't let their guard down. I think those are the guys that end up being really successful because even if you're in a situation where you're not having a great game, that that one chance you know to impact the team, whether it's get a dirt ball read or you know make a great a great throw from the corner to a cut that leads to an out of the plate. You know, the one thing is that sense of urgency, and I kind of get it, it goes back to a little bit of an old school model is, um, you know, play hard. I think the guys that the guys that play hard and the guys compete are guys that separate themselves because they know who they are and they know how to play the game. And um, I think those are things that have to jump off the page for fans and, and make them excited about going to watch that player and rooting for them to be a 10 year big leaguer. Now, your son Ryan is at AAA Albuquerque. Can you give us a quick scouting report on him, what you think of his game? Uh, yeah, I'll tell you what. Um, you know, Ryan Ryan um, can really play anywhere. He got drafted as a shortstop. He's playing outfield now. 
Um, I think there's, you know, there's, there's a profile for him somewhere at second base uh, in his, in his future, but, you know, being a national league team and uh, trying to be a guy that can kind of take the handcuffs off of a manager uh, with some versatility. I think the Rockies have done a good job really growing him in the game with uh, a lot of games at short games at third games at right games and left. I think he's played even a little bit of center, um, not in a professional game yet, but in the, you know, the alternate side and um, some of the training that he's had. But I, I think the biggest scouting report on Ryan is he plays winning baseball. I think that's the biggest thing is he's, he's out there competing, looking for an edge. And, um, you know, he, he wants to be the toughest out in the ballpark every night. So um, as he continues to grow and get bigger and stronger, um, you know, he just turned 22 and he's in triple A. So that's yet another challenge the Rockies have put in front of him, but you know, he's got to, he's got to be ready to, to, to play anybody. And that's, that's kind of the way he looks at it. He, he just he shows up and whoever's out there is out there and it's, it's time to go to war. Now, I want to talk about this. The Keeper of the Game Foundation, you started this up back in 2014, I believe. Uh, talk a little bit about what this foundation is and how it came about. Yeah, awesome. I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, Keeper of the Game is a foundation that I started uh, when I was coaching in AA with the Texas Rangers. What we do is we serve those with special needs and disabilities in and around the game of baseball. Uh, we do this by supporting existing programming, uh, programs like Special Olympics, Angel League, Challenger League, Miracle League. Uh, but we also create our own programming you know, through our foundation uh, to serve those that need us most. And we've had so many great events. We've had so many great people that have really poured into our foundation. We've done things from you know, sending you know, kids to major league games to hosting uh, big groups out to minor league baseball games. So it's really, um, it's a passion and it's, it's one of those things that awareness wise, you know, it's really, uh, it's really fun, really fun to, to do this. It really is. I know I've worked with a minor league team out in Bristol, the Bristol Pirates for a couple of years. And we always had the partnership with the local challenger league where we would have some of those kids with special needs, but they would come out and they would have a great time playing on the field with the players. So it's really great to see you doing this kind of program too. Uh, what are some ways that people can help the foundation? Do you have any events or ways that people can help out? Yeah, the biggest thing for us is, is the awareness. I mean, we operate out of Frisco, Texas. Most of our, most of our events, you know, cater towards, you know, the, the natural progression of baseball um, locally out at spring training and then at minor league games. But if anybody wants info, they can go to keeperofthegame.org. And we have um, an email where they can get info. It'll go right to our executive director, Brian Hopter, who is, uh, he's a stud. He does an awesome job with the foundation. And whether somebody wants to be involved with Keeper of the Game or not, I think the big thing is, is creating social awareness for those with special needs and disabilities. And for, for me, bridging the gap uh, for them you know, to the game of baseball and the seamless transition, that's my passion. Well, that's really great. Well, that was all the questions that I had for you. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Yeah, you got it, Michael. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. All right. That was James Valade. Thank you again. And that will do it for this episode of the 27th inning. Thanks again to James for being on the show. Don't forget to check out keeperofthegame.org to learn more about their work and how you can help out. Make sure to subscribe for future episodes, and you can find the show now on Apple, Google, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever else you listen to your podcasts. If you have suggestions for future guests you'd like to hear from or questions that you'd like them to answer, drop a comment or send us a message on Instagram at the 27th inning. And also make sure to give it a follow to get updates on the show and upcoming guests. Check back for next week's episode where you'll hear from former pitcher Isla Borders, the first woman to play in men's independent league baseball. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.